Spirit. And bless us be my kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, and all desires known. And from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name. In Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. See now, I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in the tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in your mind, for the Lord is with you. That same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one who built my house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought you up, brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent in the tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal elders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great wounds of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so they may live in their own place, and be disrupted no more, and the evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares 
to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are filled, fulfilled, and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. The word of the Lord. This is a reading from Psalms 89, reading responsibility by half birds. I have found David my servant. My hand will hold you fast. My heart will make you strong. No enemy shall deceive you. No enemy will man bring you down. I will crush his foes before him. Strike down the rest of the My faithfulness and love shall be with him. And he shall be victorious through my name. I shall make his union extend from the great seas of the river. He will say to me, You are my father. I will make him my firstborn. I will keep my love for him forever. I will establish his land forever. If his children forsake my law, if they break my statutes, do not keep my commandments. I will punish their transgressions with a rod, and their iniquities will lash. But I will not take my love from him. Nor my faithfulness to the cross. I will not break my covenant. Nor change the covenant of my purpose. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness. I will not lie to him. His line shall endure forever. And his throne is the sun before me. It shall stand fast forevermore. Like the moon, finding witness in the sky. <coughs> Reading from the uh, second letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Remember that, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called circumcision, a physical circumcision made by the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances, and he, that he may create in himself one new humanity in peace of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God and one body to the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us, having access to one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles, with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord.
The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to eat. And, and they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns that arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at the Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized them and rushed about that whole region, began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. It's no shock to say that we have in our society and in our world at this point some extreme instances of division. Racial, political, socioeconomic, religious. The first century was really no different. The Jews were at that point a very insulated people. The Religious ideology that had developed over hundreds of years positioned them, if not opposed to, then certainly as separated from everyone else by virtue of their chosenness as children of the Jewish God, Yahweh. Paul, who was a Jew, makes this abundantly clear when he addresses a group of Gentiles in the church at Ephesus in our reading today. Remember that you Gentiles at one time were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Pretty harsh, huh? By the way, a Gentile was anyone who wasn't a Jew. Paul is outlining a theological position here that is in tandem with his Jewish national identity. And this is the beginning, honestly, of what's called covenant theology in Christianity. Covenant theology says that salvation comes only through the Jews. And because the Jews didn't do too good of a job recognizing Jesus as Messiah, everyone else in the world, the Gentiles, gets to have a shot at being saved. And this is, by the way, a theological position that is still pretty widely subscribed to by a whole lot of people who use the term Christian to describe themselves. Paul starts to soften his tone and come to the center a little more. And he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. Well, that's fantastic, but for Paul, it is still very much decidedly, you guys over there were hopeless without us. So you Gentiles now get a chance to come over here and be like honorary Jews, one with us in Jesus. Maybe it's just me, but that sounds a whole lot like what most of the evangelical church tells people who are not a part of it. 
Come be a part of us. Because we have Jesus over here. We've got him in a nice little box that we keep him in. And you can have Jesus too if you think like we do. And give us your money and promise to be really good. By now, I think you all know me pretty well. Enough to guess that I like to address things head on. You know, rather than skirting around the challenges that we deal with in our country leading up to the election in November, when I get a chance, I like to speak to them. But I'm also a firm believer that the church should not be prescriptively political. It's nobody's business but yours who you vote for. The church's responsibility is to represent the life and teachings of Christ to humanity. But this gets all the more complicated when people who are a part of the church exercise their allegiance to their political party and their country above their allegiance to Christ. I think it's a, an incredibly important to be clear here. Jesus and the truth of God about humanity does not come in a political package. And I believe that the Apostle Paul had it wrong when he said that the Gentiles were at one point without Christ, having no hope, and without God in the world. God is not political. God is not national or even tied to a religion. This is one of the main reasons that I flatly reject the idea of this theistic anthropomorphic God out there on a throne somewhere in the cosmos. Now that God is easily conscripted to whatever ideology benefits our selfish human tendencies and has been used that way for literal centuries to horrific results. Now God, the ground of your being, is not withholden or beholden to political ideology. Politics and government and nationality were never meant to hold your hopes and dreams they are incapable of addressing on a foundational level the brokenness of humanity. Unconditional sacrificial love and grace are the supernatural laws of God, the essence of the universe that followers of Christ are called to embody before allegiance to anything else. What I see happening now and what I assume will only get more obvious in the coming months is that our two political parties are engaging in their own brand of covenant theology, shouting back and forth at each other that God is on our side as if the essence of the universe, the ground of our being could be contained and defined by such a feeble and incomplete scaffolding. If the country was led by our people and our rules, then God and righteousness would be restored in our society and everything would be better. But if our people don't get elected, then we have to suffer through God knows what negative and detrimental godless conditions and effects. At the beginning of today's reading in Ephesians, Paul dives headlong into some of this very covenantal theology style language. And I have to be honest, I start to check out of it because it sounds like everything that I heard when I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. I am not knocking them, but they are a very covenant theology oriented denomination. And I bristle at that language. And here's why. Because for me, it does not sound much like how Jesus represented himself in the Gospels. Just when I was ready to check out of this reading completely, <laughs> Paul 
stumbles on some beautiful language in which the nature of Jesus seems to shine through. Like so many of us, Paul and his inability and his brokenness stumbles on the light of Christ. And this is Paul talking about Jesus. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and to be peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom, in whom you were also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Jesus, especially toward the end of his life, didn't take sides. His message was peace to the near and peace to the far off. And this is not an easy thing to hold in our minds, but Orthodox Christian theology holds that Jesus was the embodiment of divinity. And what you do with that information has a lot to do with how you structure your approach to faith and spirituality. Our, our theology moves that concept even further. Not only was Jesus the embodiment of divinity, he was the revelation of divinity in all of humanity. And this is where I think Paul and we go off the tracks in our perception None of us, Jew or Gentile, has ever been a stranger or an alien to God. Jesus shows us our true nature, our true potential and purpose as humans. The second century theologian Irenaeus is quoted as having said, the glory of God is man fully alive. And what is humanity fully alive? It's waking up to the complexity and diversity in the experience of life and all of its ups and downs and tragedies and triumphs and seeing within that the eternal life of Christ at the center. It's discovering the life of Christ living within us, grounding us in our purpose and centering us in our loving union with God, continually Reborn into this rebound of love that keeps coming back over and over and over again as we empty ourselves and say yes and yes and yes. Paul says we are members of the household of God through Jesus, but not only that, we, you and me and everyone else are built together into a dwelling place for God. God, the essence of the universe, is not out there somewhere. <clears throat> Paul is helping to establish one of, if not the most important cornerstones of our theology, that God dwells within us. Not just conservatives, not just this country, not just the rich, not just the Christians, not just the ones who believe. All of humanity a dwelling place for God. And our role is the same as the role of Jesus to reveal that astounding and incomprehensible truth to the world one person at a time. And that is the hope of humanity. That is the hope that politics will never be able to approach. 
So as we journey together through the next few months towards November, may we be able to keep that reality in our, in our focus, right there at our center. May we allow that truth of God about us and about everyone else to guide our decisions, not just at the ballot box, but so much more importantly in our interactions and in our relationships with each other, because that is where true hope takes shape and comes into being. Now stand and reaffirm the words of our ancient faith found in the Apostles' Creed in the worship people. Saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last day. You may be seated for the prayers of the people. <clears throat> Comfort us, gracious one, in our anxiety and worry, and grant us such rest and renewal that we may be strengthened to share in your reconciling and healing work to bring peace to the world, as we pray. You are our God, our Savior, and the rock of our salvation. Infinite and loving God, your church has been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. Break down the dividing walls within your body and be our peace that we may act no longer as strangers and aliens, but as citizens with the saints and all the members of the household of God. You are our God. Our Savior and the rock of our salvation. Give us rest from our enemies and guide our leaders to be instruments of peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. You are our God. Our Savior and the rock of our salvation. Bring your reconciling love and infinite peace to all who suffer from any trouble or injustice throughout the world. That they may be touched by your healing presence. You are our God. Our Savior and the rock of our salvation. Let your faithfulness and love be with us and with all our neighbors. And no one shall be a stranger or an alien. But everyone may live together in your new humanity. You are our God. Our Savior and the rock of our salvation. Touch with your healing grace all who are sick, anxious, or fearful. We pray especially for Clay, Ryan, and family, for family of Bob, Malone, Jim, and Chip, and Keith, Bo, Corey, Ted. Jean, Fletcher, Lisa, Lisa Marie, Kathy M, Carol and Jacob, Mary Lou, Buster, Terry, Lynn, Ann, Rio, Mary, Pat, Kristen, Mary, Ronnie, Elaine H, 
Ashley, Brenda, Jolene, Franklin, George, Chloe, Molly, Casey, Cody, Sophia, Anya, Carol, Brian, Ray and Mary, Jim and Robbie, Dan, Leslie, Kathy and Tony, and all those in need of prayer. Are there others? We also pray for those long-term prayer needs. Neil, Beth, Danny, Rich, Russell, Rosetta, Jensen, Cynthia, Stephen, Judd, <coughs> Margaret, Chuck, <coughs> Martha, Adrian, Will, Kermit, Ivan, Dean, Janet, Jean, Tom, Pat, Francis, and Ward Gladys. We pray for all the first responders and all the armed forces and defend their families. Noah, Joe, Tim, Christopher, Lewis, Patrick, Brandon, Ashlyn, Sarah Grace, Bernie, John, Hunter, Joel, Austin, Junior, Eric, Zane, and all in harm's way are the others. In the diocese and cycle prayer, we pray for our fellow parish, the St. Cyprian's and East Florida. We pray for the victims of crime everywhere and the inmates and staff for the federal prison camp and the REAP reentry program in Pensacola Park and for their families. In the Anglican cycle prayer, we pray for the Anglican Episcopal Church of Japan. We pray for all people affected by war and natural disaster. You keep your law for us forever. And so we offer our prayers, thanksgiving especially for the wedding anniversary of Betsy and Bill, and the birthdays of Maybell, Donna, Connie Joe, Jerry, JT, and Mary Lou. You have promised that you will not take your love from your people. Let those who have died rest in your love and be given the eternal name, especially while alone. You are our God. Our Savior and rock of our salvation. You are our peace, O God. Give us renewing rest that we may rise daily to share your healing and reconciling work with Jesus Christ, our ruler and shepherd. Who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. To make our confession and absolution, I invite you to remain seated to stand or to kneel as you wish. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, saying together, God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you. Opposing your will in our lives, we have denied your goodness to each other and ourselves in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, the evil done on our back. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. As we rise together, my brothers and sisters, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, also with you. you. Try to fill this thing up 
over and over again with as much poundage of these items uh, that we can possibly put in there. Uh, we partner with EMI all year long in a lot of different ways, but we emphasize that partnership in July. So uh, if you're out and about, please do uh, pick up some of these things that you see on this list. Uh, again, you'll see the thought bubbles there. Um, the dollar stores have great deals on the heavier items like laundry detergent and dishwashing liquids. So grab that stuff from there and that will give us a lot more than our total poundage at the end of July as we try to measure up and surpass last year's amount. Uh, so make sure you, you take, uh, take that hint and run with it. Um, down at the bottom of your insert, uh, you'll see the Jonathan Meyer Daniels pilgrimage that is scheduled for August the 10th, Saturday, August the 10th. I want to get this out of the way first and foremost. This is the single hottest event on the calendar in the Diocese of the Central Gulf Coast. Without a doubt. Okay. It just is. But it is that moving and that significant of an event that it is worth every single ounce of sweat that you just sweat to be in this. I want to strongly encourage you that you are able and available uh, to attend this at least once. Let this be the year. Um, if you don't know the story of Jonathan Daniels, um, it's, a, it's a very involved story. But the gist of it is uh, he was an Episcopal deacon uh, who, was, who was martyred. He was murdered in 1965 during the Civil Rights Movement in an effort to, um, to increase voting rights and voting activity in uh, some in the surrounding areas, and particularly in Hainville, Alabama, uh, the county seat uh, of Lowndes County. And so what happens is uh, there people gather from all over the country, really, um, in, in Hainville, and we retrace the route uh, from the, the city square to the, uh, the Lowndes County Jail, and from that jail to the point where, um, where Jonathan Daniels was martyred. Um, and then we walk back to the county courthouse, and that county courthouse is transformed into a worship space. Uh, the judge's bench is made into a Eucharistic table, and uh, we celebrate the Eucharist there as the body of Christ. And uh, we memorialize not only Jonathan, but to others who have given their lives in the service of Christ as martyrs in Alabama uh, over that period of time. And so it's a moving moving important day uh, that we co-sponsor uh, and co-host with the Diocese of Alabama. Uh, on the Sunday before that Saturday, we're going to show a documentary uh, about the life of Jonathan Daniels. It's called uh, Here Am I Send Me, and that'll happen in between services starting at, I believe we said, um, what did we say? I can't remember when we said it, but as soon as, yes? Oh, I, when you say, I was just going to add in James and uh, Fairhope is having is going to take a van. Okay. Now it's not a big bus, but you know, I don't know, 15, 16. It's on the flyer. If anyone doesn't want to drive their own car, you can get in touch with uh, uh, St. James and get on that list to drop. Okay, wonderful. 920. 920 is when we're going to show that. So as soon as the 830 service gets out, it's about 59 minutes, so it's a full hour. Uh, but it's worth seeing, especially if you intend to go and you want more background about the whole story. Uh, so please do come and be a part of that. That's going to be on the 4th of August, leading up to the 10th, which is a Saturday. And pretty much that entire morning um, up into the early afternoon is spent here in Hainville. Food is available on site for a, uh, for a small donation, I think, of $10. Lunch is available. Walk in love. It's Christ loved us. He gave himself for us and offered him a sacrifice to God.
your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to you, God of all time and our time. We are grateful for the ways you have been revealed to us in the past, through the memories of life that have shaped us into who we are today, and through a shared hope the consolation and redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ. Confident of your love, we find our whole selves in your presence, our achievements and our failures, our proud moments and our hidden shame, our undying dreams and our steadfast resolve. At this table of grace and goodness, we meet you through a sacred communion with all of creation. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that brings to eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. <laughs> Those who have been here often and those who have not, 
and those of us who have tried to follow Jesus, and those of us who have failed. It is Christ who invites us here to his table to receive him in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world of peace. And grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forevermore. Amen.